Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Tamar Meisels and today we're going to talk about Haredim in Israel. This group Haredim is also known as ultra-orthodox or strictly orthodox. In this episode, we're going to talk about who the Haredim are and a little bit about their history. In the next episodes, we're going to talk about why they don't join the Israeli army. We're going to talk a little bit about the Haredi school system and how that looks and about the economics, how they are able to support themselves. In Israel, about 75% of the population is Jewish. And if we look at the entire population, 13% of the population are Haredim. In a 2021 survey, when they asked Jews living in Israel how they define themselves religiously, about 45% said they are secular, 35% are traditional, 11% are religious, regular Orthodox like myself, and 10% define themselves Haredi. So Orthodox, religious in general in Israel can be divided into the more modern religious uh, like myself, also religious Zionists, these are on one end, and the ultra-Orthodox. So as a more modern Orthodox, you know, I might look a little bit different than regular society, but the more modern, we're pretty much integrated into society. We serve in the army, we go to higher education. For the Haredim, they're usually a segregated community. They have limited access to newspapers, smartphones, internet. They usually live in their own separate neighborhoods, even sometimes cities. They're very strict about religion and Jewish law and customs and Torah learning. They have a separate school system where they learn, if at all, very little uh, math and secular studies. They generally don't go to the Israeli army or go to any higher education. 51% of the men work, which is very low compared to 81% of general Israeli men employment levels. For women, on the other hand, 75% of the women do work, which is very close to the female employment rate. And the reason is, is because men generally devote themselves and their lives to Torah learning, even at the expense of, you know, living in poverty or living in very low living conditions. Radi community isn't just, you know, one group. It's divided into a lot of smaller groups. You can say that there are three main groups. The first one is about a third of the Haredi community is Lita, which means these are traditional uh, Jewish originating from Ashkenaz, from the from Europe, and th from the area of Lita, and they were traditionally opposed to the second group, which is a third of the population is Hasidim. Hasidim are generally more uh, mystical, and there's hundreds of different Hasidim. They are usually around a specific rabbi, and it was from towns in uh, Europe, and they take a more mystical approach, where the Lita Lithuanians take a more traditional, very focused on um, Torah learning and Gemara learning, and about a third of the population are Sephardim, um, not from Ashkenaz, they're from the Sephardi countries, and they are more like the Litaim. They are not part of the Hasidic groups, they're more similar to the Litaim, and they study in yeshivot either in the Ashkenaz Litaim or their own, which are very similar. This topic is very relevant in Israel. If you want to understand the Israeli society and some of its tensions, a lot of times governments fall over these religious issues if the Haredim should enlist in the army and stuff like that. So it's very important to understand. This is especially true because the Haredim, out of all the groups in Israel, have the highest birth rate, which is seven per family when the average Israeli family has 3.1. So surveys and studies are showing that if these trends continue, in 2065, about a third of the population in Israel will be Haredim, about 40% of the Jews in Israel will be Haredim. This might 
scare some people on one hand but on the other hand this means that we really have to learn more about them if we want to build a better relationship and understand the impact it's going to have on society and Israel's economy. Israel today has a pretty strong economy and we won't be able to continue to have so if a third of our population is choosing to be poor so this is very interesting and very relevant. I just want to make a small comment and that's I want to dive in deeper to this topic about Haredim in Israel and to understand it better. And in no means do I mean to be judgmental towards them in any way. I myself am an Orthodox Jew, not Haredi, and I have family and friends in this sector. I have respect for everyone, for all sectors. I don't think any sector is perfect or without any flaws and I think it's just very important to learn. So let's talk a little bit about history. First we'll talk about segregation and the Orthodox community in general and then we'll go on to specifically the Haredim in Israel and how their society was created. When it comes to segregating and separating from the rest of society this is something very basic and principle in Judaism to survive as a Jew across many years a lot of it had to do with keeping your ways and being segregated from society. In the Middle Ages we began to form very strong communities. Kehilot, the synagogue became a main focus. We had our own cemetery, we had a rabbi and we had our own um, representatives you know in front of the authorities. Jews didn't have civil rights, they weren't really allowed to be part of any other organizations on the outside. So you either had the choice to be a Jew in the community, in the Kehillah, or to be a non-Jew and to leave the walls of the community. This community was our safeguard and it kept us safe. And this was the case till the 18th century when these walls metaphorically began to fall down and Jews started to become emancipated and to be given equal rights. So Jews began to open up, were allowed to be part of society, we generally move to the bigger cities. It becomes very difficult to be a Jew and especially in the first generations, um, you know, Mendelssohn in his time, many people did assimilate and became non-Jews and we also have the start of the Jewish reform movement. If you're interested in this period of time and how the Jewish reform movement was created, I made a separate video on that and I highly recommend you go watch that. So many do assimilate and others join the reform movement and this is when orthodoxy responds. The principle of the orthodox of the time and one of the main leaders which is the Khatam Sofer, we form a separate kehila and we segregate even from groups within the Jewish community. Not only do we stick to traditional Judaism and Jewish law and oral law, they also emphasize the importance of customs and minhagim. Any change in the customs can be a slippery slope and lead to further changes and to assimilation. The Khatam Sofer is also known for his slogan, Chadash Asur Min HaTorah. New is forbidden from the Torah. Now this phrase is taken from the Mishnah to mean that the new wheat we're not allowed to use until we bring the Omer offering. What he takes to mean is that any changes, any change in customs is forbidden. So Haredim was a nickname used for all Orthodox groups, even the more liberal ones or the ones that were more integrated into society such as some of the German uh, Orthodoxes and stuff like that. Charede means Chared Ledvar Hashem. It's taken from a Pasuk, Charedim Ledvar Hashem. We fear God's words. And you could say that also in general, the Charedim today, they are afraid of changes. They feel threatened by the outside world and its different waves. And so they choose to take a step back and shield themselves from it. But in the 1950s, as this particular Orthodox group, which is the Torah Learning Society, Chevrat Halomdim, is more established, Haredim becomes a term used specifically for this group. How did this Torah Learning Society form? Many of these Orthodox communities were murdered in the Holocaust by the Nazis and the Yeshiva and the Torah world was destroyed. So many made it their mission to rebuild the Torah world. For example, in 1944, Rav Kahaneman built the Punibij Yeshiva, 
which was named after a yeshiva in um, Europe called Ponivej. And today, thousands of students study in that yeshiva and in many more. Also at the time after the Holocaust, most of the Israelis, the Tzabars that lived in Israel were secular. So this made them want to distinguish themselves even further from the general society, which was secular. A few days before the British mandate was about to end and Israel was about to declare independence, Israel's security was not that well. We were about to be invaded by five armies. Ben Gurion and the rabbis come to an agreement where 400 Torah students will be given an exempt from joining the army. Ben Gurion explained later that the reason he gave this exemption was because all the Torah places in the world were destroyed and this was the only country to still have yeshiva and because it was a small amount of 400 people, he gave them the exemption. Since then, thousands of people have used this exemption and devoted their lives to Torah learning because this exemption was given only to those who would dedicate and make Torah their full-time gig. And also at the time, the Chazonish, who was a great rabbi, worked on establishing this learning society. The idea was to build an idealistic community a utopian society where everyone is a devout Torah learner and we form communities around these yeshivot. Till the 1950s, a Haredi man would study Torah until he would get married. At that point, he would go and find work. He needs to start supporting his family. The idea is in this utopian society, you dedicate your life to Torah learning. Even after you are married, you continue for a few years, sometimes even for an entire lifetime to study Torah. After you get married, you move to a designated yeshiva for married people known as the Kolel, and there you could continue to study Torah for years. Uh, some people even devote their entire lives to Torah studying. The women in the society take it upon themselves to support their family and to be the breadwinners. And they do this because of the high value that they see of Torah learning. Because Torah learning is one of the most important things you can do. It sustains the world. They believe that if Torah learning were stopped for even one second, the world would come to an end. And these walls, metaphorical, that they set up for themselves, contain them and they're able to find peace and happiness within the walls. The Haredim in studies are shown to be a very happy society. Bnei Brak, which is a Haredi city and the most poor city in Israel, 95% are pleased with their life. And in general, 62% are pleased with their life as opposed to 26% of Jews that are not Haredi. Why are they so happy? Professor Yuval Noah Harari explains that the strong ties that they form in their communities and the deep purpose and meaning that they feel in Torah learning and the mitzvot that they keep. And also perhaps, you know, they have a lot of children and also, you know, they have faith in God. Maybe these things also, uh, you know, make them the happy society that they are. Their choice, however, to be poor can affect all of us in the society. More about this in future episodes. Hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please give it a thumbs up. See you next time!